one thing I did want to speak about is um, our inf infrastructure initiative, which will help with implementation of these um, autonomous vehicles and new technologies. Uh, we've just released a request for information for um, from, from the stakeholders about uh, the possibility of autonomous trains. And I know in um, the commuter world, it's, there's been some, in this country as well, Canada, some um, progress in that. And see what, what you need. We want to hear from you. Um, we also want to um, try to get more money into the system uh, for infrastructure. Corresponding legislative plan based on the tenants um, for the infrastructure initiative. Well, first of all, we want to make uh, target federal investments, encourage self-help, self and align infrastructure investments with entities best suited to provide sustained and efficient investment, as well as leverage private sector investment. Um, the principles behind this are uh, stimulating infrastructure investment, investing in rural America, incre increasing state and local authority, limiting regulatory barriers, streamlining and the permitting process, and empowering American workers. Um, we're trying to unburden um, a lot of our infrastructure, which, yes, we need to have environmental analysis and see what the impacts are, mitigate those, those potential impacts, uh, but we also can't be left behind. We can't have studies that last 12 and 15 years just to build a bridge. Uh, we, need to, we need to move forward at a much faster rate. We need to figure out how we're going to analyze these environmental impacts more, more efficiently and bring it down to more of a two-year review and then instead of a 12-year review. Uh, so that's very important for, um, for this administration. Um, but, uh, but with that, I think um, we have an ample amount of information that we're going to present to you. Um, you know, Granted, P3s and private investment are, are very important, but uh, one thing we want to talk about today is uh, positive train control and how important that is and how we're going to work with, with your um, organizations to help do whatever we can to, uh, to meet the, the looming deadlines. Um, so with that, um, I'll let Carl uh, start his presentation. Thanks, Juan. Thanks, Doug. I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to come here today and speak to uh, the APTA members. Um, you know, the worst time to speak is either right before lunch or right after lunch. And um, I'm going to try to do my best to keep this lively. You know, speaking after lunch and being a federal employee, that's a bad mixture for people <laughs> sitting in an audience. So I'm going to do my best to uh, keep it lively. So I'm going to talk to you about three or four things. Uh, our confidential close call reporting system. Uh, our data modernization, trespasser prevention, and then I'll uh, follow up, or I'll, I'll end up with uh, PTC. Um, and at any point, and I know we're going to have questions afterwards, so I look forward to, to fielding those. Um, how many folks are here are familiar with the confidential close call reporting system? I'll refer to it as C3RS throughout. Yeah, that's a, that's a really, many, many, or a few of you are, are, are member railroads. Um, it's an important initiative for us because it's proactive. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, basically it is a program whereby an employee, uh, in whatever craft they are, if they, as long as they have a memorandum of understanding with labor and with FRA, they can report something that has happened, where they broke a, broke a rule or broke a, a, a regulation or, or ran afoul of regulation, and put all this information in about how it happened, all the inf or some context for it. And they can do that and not have to worry about any type of uh, punitive measures uh, by management because management is gaining that information and it gives them something to work with. From there it goes to NASA who contracts with us and we, they de-identify all that information so anything that would call out a particular railroad, so there's no attribution in the, at the end of the day. So by the time anybody looks at it, nobody could tell which railroad this happened on. Uh, but what it does happen is it goes to the uh, peer review teams at each railroad, each craft, and they look at it, and they say, well, what were the safety issues? Where did we, fall, we as an organization fall short, and what can we change to prevent a similar occurrence? Because 
while there was an overspeed event and nothing happened, or somebody ran a red signal and nothing happened, that doesn't mean it can't happen. It was demonstrated earlier today in uh, Kentucky on the Norfolk Southern. I don't know if everybody's aware of that, but you miss a, you miss a red signal, really bad things can happen. Um, so they can put things in place to prevent that from happening. So this, this is something that we, you know, this is a, 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 a relatively young program. We have a few, uh, uh, about a hand, two handfuls, about 10 member railroads, um, and that's great. And they're, they're, they are reaping benefits from it. There are benefits from uh, participation. Um, just some statistics so you're aware. Since this program went live with NASA, um, we've done almost 11,000 reports um, this year alone so far, or in September, or I'm, I'm sorry, February, 294 reports, and last year, 4,000 reports. So there's a lot of information out there, a lot of good information that we're, we're each, each railroad is mining and trying to make improvements. Where we want to go with it now is we want to make this information available, available to FRA, available others, so others can learn from this. And again, the information is totally de-identified, so there will be no attribution. Um, and again, the ultimate goal is to get to a culture of safety, first and foremost, and followed by a culture of compliance. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is our, is, is, uh, our data modernization. The one, thing, the one thing, and everybody's doing this, everybody's trying to go to a data-driven approach. Um, and what we, so what we need to do is we need to have data fast, and it has to be accurate. And I'm not saying, I, I'm not saying our data is not accurate, but I think we can do a better job on our end. You know, we have data that we have access to internally, and we have access that's available to the public, and we want to make sure whatever you get is, is one, happening quickly, so it's a, you know, we have a 60 or 90 day lag and from the time it comes in till it's available. We want to speed that up, and we want to make sure whatever data you get is, is robust and you have full faith and confidence in that. We also want to provide visualization tools, because sometimes looking at a spreadsheet is not fun, and you certainly can't get anything out of it. But when you begin to visualize that, whether it be putting it on a map, uh, bar charts, pie graphs, that type of stuff, things, trends, um, issues jump out at you. And it's much easier for you to understand and also to make other people understand who may not be as savvy as people in this industry are uh, or the people in this room are. So it, visualization's a big deal. Analytics, you know, there's a lot of advance, advancements in anal analytic capabilities. Um, some of the things we're trying are like IBM Watson to see what we can do. We're, we're looking at taking stuff from social media to see if we can pick up on trends that may, may, may lead us to insights in grade crossing and trespasser fatalities. So as far as the visualization, visualization, we have a grade crossing dashboard that's on our website and we also have a map through GIS on our website that shows where trespassing incidents have happened. Again, it helps us identify hot spots on, on different railroad properties. So these are all important tool, tools. I, I, I bring it up because the, we're pushing this is, issue and these initiatives and, you know, maybe next year or in the near future, hopefully, we can show some things that we've done that will, will be helpful to you. The next thing I want to talk about is trespasser prevention. So those are great crossing and trespassers, when, and you all know this. When you think about the number of fatalities that happen related to rail relations, uh, rail operations, 90, 95% of it is grade crossing and trespassers. You can see grade crossing, we're making, some, we're making some headway, but it seems to have leveled out. You know, we're gonna have to come up with a new way of doing things. Trespass seems to be going in the wrong direction the last couple years. So there's, there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and rec recently, um, the House Appropriations Committee has directed FRA to, to do a study of causal factors for trespass incidents and then come up with a strategy to mitigate those, the, those risks. So we're working on that, and we're learning, we're learning a lot in the process. And when you begin to look at the, the issue, the, you know, there's the look at the individual, the victim, or the person who actually breaks the law and gets hit by the, gets hit by a train or injured. There's the railroad and all the effects that happen to a railroad and its employees, the engineer, sometimes has a hard time recovering from that, that event. Uh, the, the, the fluidity of the system, 
is affected. Um, then you look at the communities, and you know the communities suffer. Um, but you know a lot of the communities are really up against it. When we we took all the all the trespass fatalities on the top 10 counties in the United States, and when you begin to look at that, and you say, okay, here's all the trespass fatalities, these numbers, and there's the fatalities related to murder, murders, drug overdoses, highway fatalities. Now all of a sudden, trespass makes up about one to two percent of all those fatalities. And, commuter, and communities are looking at, well, how do, we, how do we spend our resources? So it's a really complicated issue um, that we, as a government, working with communities, with the railroads, and hopefully getting the word out to individuals, we can modify behavior and maybe do some, make some engineering changes that may help and, and address the issue. So this, this report that we're putting together is due um, at, at August, uh, August 1st and we fully intend to make that deadline. So this is an, an ongoing effort. And finally, uh, PTC. Um, you know, the, the compliance date is looming large, the end of this year. Um, and if you get, if you meet certain criteria, then you can get an extension to 2020. And then short lines under certain circumstances will ha could get an extension to 2023. So just in case, you weren't aware, I'm just going to run down the things you need to have in place in order to get an extension for your railroad for PTC implementation. So all the equipment has to be in place. So, so your locomotives and your wayside uh, equipment, back off, your back office has to be up and running. The training of your per of, of personnel, you have to have purchased the bandwidth. You have to have an approved implementation plan. And you have to have under, you have to have started revenue service demonstration on the majority of your network. So with, if you hit all those marks, then you can come in for an alternative schedule and uh, an extension to the 2020 date. So, so far this year, we, you know, at FRA, you know, there's work that we can do too. It's not just the, not just the railroads. We've met with the railroads to understand what the issues are. And you're all probably familiar with the issues. Host-tenant relationships, interoperability. And maybe even there's, a, there's some of uh, the availability of equipment. So we understand that. And that we, we're going to be initiating meetings with the manufacturers of the equipment <coughs> to see what we can do to work with them to help expedite that and make this equipment available and do a better job coordinating with the railroads. Um, you know, so, so again, another thing that we can do is what we, and what we need to do is as as requests come in, so you have your implementation plans, you have your request for um, amendment in case you want to change, and you know that goes you know there's a lot of, anything that changes in your implementation plan you need to put in a request for implementation, and 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 get that approval and then also a request for revenue service demonstration. So what we need to do is we need to make sure we're, we're timely in our processing of that. We're timely and we're accurate. And so we're, we're developing teams to make sure that we're, we're getting these requests, we're processing, we're responding as quickly as, as we can in a, in a, as an agency. But one, one, two things I want to share before, I, before I'm finished here. You know, we, we FRA, we want to urge the railroads, you all, to work together and uh, to uh, share lessons learned, because each of each of the railroads is going to come across. They're, they're all different, but there are going to be common issues that you're going to have to overcome. And understanding when when one railroad has gone through something and they've managed to overcome it is going to be helpful to other railroads to get to to deal with that same problem. And then finally, something and nobody wants to hear this, um, so. Of course, I wait till the end to say it so I can get out of here. Um, <laughs> but um, start thinking about the future. You know, we're going to get we're going to get to the point where PTC is implemented. But then there's going to be next generation technology, um, and there's going to be maintenance re uh, maintenance required. Now, how's that going to look? How's that going? How's your railroad going to deal with that? So these are the type of things that we sort of proactively we need to look at. Um, we have experts. We have a lot of folks at FRA that can certainly help you with that. They, they have a broad, broad view of what's happening, um, and we're, we're always happy to help out um, with, the, with those type of things. So 
with that, I'll stop and I'll turn it over to Paul Nissenbaum and uh, he'll cover policy issues. Thank you. Carl took about 20 minutes to get through one slide and I have like nine slides, but I will go at a much faster clip. So <laughs> it's hopefully <laughs> keep you awake as well. Um, and this, was, this is a uh, sort of a summary of the schedule that Carl just reviewed, and we probably will come back to this when we get to, to uh, Q&A. Um, I'm going to talk to you on the money side of the equation. So you had your post-lunch government employee, who's also the regulator, speaking, but now we're going to lighten it up a little bit with funding. Uh, although FTA tends to be your funding partner for uh, most of your programs, FRA does have funding available that, uh, uh, that uh, can overlap uh, with your needs. And specifically on PTC, since 2011, uh, we have provided over $2.2 billion uh, towards PTC implementation, including about $925 million in grant funds through a variety of different programs, uh, and then $1.3 billion or so in credit programs, both RIF and TIFIA. <clears throat> At this point, what we're hearing from most railroads is that funding is not the primary issue. Folks can always use money, uh, but that uh, we're into the you know, sort of final period of implementation and, and issues tend to be more around uh, uh, the interoperability issues that, that Carl talked about uh, and actually just getting the system up and running and tested and, and, and moving forward. But there are still folks who have talked about uh, some additional funding needs. And in that context, we have uh, several different programs that are out there on the street right now. Uh, we talk about, sort of about the three uh, legs here, the FTA, which I'm not going to speak about, but many of you, I think, are familiar with FTA's programs. The Build America Bureau, which is our central repository for all credit and loan programs. The RIF, TIFIA, and private activity bond programs are managed out of the, the Build America Bureau. Uh, and that has been a good source. Uh, for uh, railroad investment uh, in the past, and we'd like to see even more of that utilized going forward. Uh, FRA now has several new grant programs that have been authorized under the FAST Act, uh, and we have two notices of funding availability that are out on the street uh, right now. Uh, the uh, CRISI program, uh, Comprehensive uh, Rail uh, Safety and Investment Program, uh, and the Restoration and Enhancement Program. Uh, so a total of about $73 million is available right now under those two programs. Uh, those notices went out on February 21st, uh, and uh, there's a uh, staggered due dates and, uh, uh, for those two programs. I should mention also that TIGER, uh, which is the intermodal program managed out of the Office of the Secretary, uh, just had announcements of its re most recent round of funding uh, last week, and we expect in the next several months we will have announcements under the infra program, which is uh, freight rails particularly uh, uh, eligible under that program. Let me talk briefly about the two that we have out on the street right now, Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvement Program. Uh, this is a very broad uh, tent. This program funds just about anything you can think of in rail is eligible under this program, passenger and freight, uh, in including uh, inner city passenger rail. Uh, short lines uh, are a target here that are uh, eligible. First program, uh, first grant program we've had available that's, that uh, short lines uh, may apply to. Uh, Amtrak, local governments, state entities, uh, transportation uh, research institutions, et cetera. So it's a very wide ranging uh, set of eligibility and capital projects eligible under it, uh, also very wide ranging. If you can think of a rail related project, it's eligible. Track, stations, equipment, PTC, congestion mitigation, grade crossings, et cetera. Uh, so that is, that is our kind of big tent program. We then have a fairly narrowly targeted program, restoration and enhancement. Uh, this is targeted at initiating, restoring, or enhancing inner city passenger rail service uh, on corridors either that had it in the past or are, are interested in enhancing uh, their service. Uh, it, this is uh, targeted to state entities, local governments, uh, Amtrak and rail carriers. 
Uh, and uniquely, this program covers operating assistance for those programs. So typically, we will have uh, capital only. Uh, this one allows for operating expenses uh, in a transition basis to be provided uh, to those types of services. Common criteria that we're using for evaluating our grant programs in general, uh, the typical sort of evaluation criteria under technical merit and project benefit, and, and then we have priorities of uh, the department, which are consistent with the statute, uh, the economic vitality, uh, leverage of funding, so the more the non-federal share, the better, uh, innovation and accountability. One important criteria I should mention that's common to all of our programs now is a rigorous cost-benefit analysis. So we are looking for uh, folks to submit with their grant applications uh, a, a cost-benefit analysis. There's guidance on the website as to how to perform those, uh, and that's a, a key criteria now that we're using to, to evaluate. I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, the research and development arm, which is, uh, comes under my office and very much works closely with Carl's office and the Office of Safety, uh, to come up with some of that innovative, forward-looking uh, technology and safety uh, pr uh, practices that we can then start to make, uh, to institutionalize as they become uh, viable. We have, uh, coming this week, an announcement for a broad, uh, we call it a broad agency announcement, a BAA, for innovative rail research ideas. Uh, and we're looking for any and all ideas uh, to bring forward. Uh, in, typically, we categorize these into our four disciplines of human factors rolling stock, train control, and track. Uh, we also have a category this year for intelligent railroad systems that's targeted at universities and colleges. Uh, so uh, get your ideas in and look for that announcement uh, coming out this week. We have partnerships really across industry, uh, public and private sector, for our research uh, and development efforts, including many folks uh, that are part of APTA. Uh, and I want to just talk about a couple of research projects that are underway right now that we're, we're partnering with, uh, with folks on the commuter side. The first is a, a program down in Orlando, Florida. And this was initiated by the city of Orlando uh, once the, uh, after the SunRail service was initiated and they were experiencing some significant grade crossing issues. And as Carl pointed out in uh, his presentation, grade crossings continue to be an issue that we are struggling with. We've made good progress, but now I've sort of seen that flatten out. And particularly as new services get introduced, a risk of grade crossing uh, accidents can increase. So working with uh, Orlando, uh, we looked at photo enforcement technologies to detect uh, violations at highway rail grade crossings. Uh, and installed cameras and then set up a pilot uh, whereby uh, folks were sent, if, they were, if there was a violation at a crossing, folks were sent to their home address, like you might get a, if you were, uh, uh, violate a speeding, uh, a photo camera uh, speeding, uh, you get a notice that looks a little like this, in fact, this is exactly what it looked like in Orlando, uh, that identifies the violation and gives you a warning. There's no fine associated with this. And the response has actually been very positive, probably because there were no fines <laughs> associated with them, but people did generally appreciate uh, the, the education, and, and many folks were unaware uh, that they had violated uh, the highway rail uh, grade crossing uh, rules. Uh, it is essentially, it's aimed, it's targeted only at those who are, um, who enter the, the uh, crossing when the gate arms are coming down and the lights have been flashing for at least four seconds. So it's not everyone who's violating, but targeting those folks, and that's where the, the highest risk is. Uh, and again, we've got quite a good response rate here in terms of collecting data from this and getting some feedback that we're in the process of analyzing working with the uh, city of Orlando. Second partnership I want to mention is up in Maine, uh, where we have uh, uh, a project looking at trespassing. Uh, and in this case, uh, there is uh, live monitoring of, of various locations uh, that, are, that are fed into the, the police uh, dispatcher, uh, and they can speak through uh, those facilities to uh, trespassers directly. Uh, and they're currently in the process of sort of looking at this, uh, seeing whether uh, this can be an effective technique. 
uh, to, to try to reduce the trespassing incidents. This is another location where we have a new train service, a new passenger train service, an extension of the Down Easter up to uh, Brunswick. And there was awareness and lack of education in terms of folks understanding the, the, the uh, frequency of those trains. So this is one where uh, we're, we're going to try everything we can to, to find ways to, to mitigate these trespasser incidents and try to educate the public about the, the risks and the dangers. So a couple of examples, and I again encourage folks, if you have ideas, please get them to us informally or through our broad agency announcement, uh, whether it be in the arena of trespassing and grade crossing or uh, any of the other safety uh, areas that we focus on. So with that, uh, Doug, I think we have some time for Q&A. Thank you very Thank much. You. And I would uh, ask and encourage uh, those of you who have questions to line up at the microphone so that you can take full advantage of our FRA uh, folks that are here to answer your questions. So please uh, come on up and start uh, getting in line to ask those questions. Um, yesterday, we obviously, the, the commuter rail industry has been really focused on positive train control. And, and we met yesterday uh, as our commuter rail committee to, to really go over the uh, the uh, progress, um, and I just wanted to kind of highlight, a few years ago, you know, we, we, we approached um, uh, Congress with a, an extension uh, of three years, uh, and it certainly wasn't because we weren't, uh, didn't, didn't prioritize positive train control and the value it brings, but we, but uh, I think the progress that's been made, um, and the progress that still needs to be made, obviously, um, has demonstrated that I think it was time that was really needed to, to really get out there and, and do this the right way. Um, and there has been a lot of progress. So um, just generally, how are you viewing the, um, the implementation prog progress on the positive train control uh, issue? I know that you had uh, all of the different <coughs> systems come in and, and, uh, and, and share uh, their insights on it. So just share whatever you'd like. Well, I, I mean, I, I can say that, um, you know, we, we appreciate everybody coming in. There is concern. There is concern that we're going to get to the point where, um, you know, at the end of 2018, there are going to be very few people implementing the, in full implementation of PTC, um, and that's okay. I mean, we get that. I mean, this is, I, you know, some of the things it <coughs> seems like we're learning as we go is this interoperability issue is mm -hmm. is a little bit more thorny than anybody yeah. had expected. Yeah. Um, what we're our, our our main concern is that we're going to get to a point where people can apply for an extension. So all those, those things that I listed during my presentation, mm -hmm. and it's significant, uh, you know, that there's a lot of work to be done. Um, we certainly want to, at the end, ideally at the end of this year, obviously most optimally is everybody makes it. That's not going to happen. Ideally is if we can get the vast majority, everybody, um, uh, really to the point where they can file for an extension. Right, right. So. Great. Thank you. Please. Yeah, uh, John Whitmore with pedestrians.org. Uh, on the trespassing issues, are there good examples of where a place where there's been a trespassing problem, uh, they've looked to identify safe and convenient alternatives for pedestrians uh, and then encourage people to use those uh, safe and convenient alternatives rather than just tell people don't do that? Um, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of anything in particular. Here's what we've done. So some of the communities we go to, we look at it and we say, we know where there's a, a homeless population, and we know where there's a food pantry or a shelter, and we can begin to see what, where, how they're traveling and how they're going there. So we've, we've worked with communities, and we've said, look, these, these are the type of issues you need to work, worry about. You've got to worry about these folks who are going here. Or there's one community where they built a, a courthouse here on this side of the track, and on the other side of the track, they put their parking lot. So there's just bad planning on those, those parts. Um, uh, but as far as anything in particular where they may have built a pedestrian bridge, is it something like that, or an underground, is some type of tunnel? I'm sure they exist on the, off the top of my head. I don't know. But uh, those are the type of things we're doing right now. We're, we're trying to look, identify those types of clear um, issues in different communities where, look, th this is going to 
not, it's going to cause and it's going to foster trespassing. And we're trying to uh, work with those communities and say, okay, what can we do to, to deal with those? I, know I hope I answered your question. I know there's a lot of uh, public awareness that we try to do in the industry to, to just inform people of how dangerous it is to be about around a railroad track. We had a, a media event out at one of our stations out in Burke Center in Fairfax County, and, and the media was there safely away from the tracks, obviously, on the platform, though. And as, as I begin my, my um, talk, uh, along with the others who were there, but as I be uh, began my talk, I can see this freight train coming around the corner. And uh, as I'm going on my talk, boom, it's, not, you know, it's blasting right past. And that really demonstrated to him, and I mentioned it after, after and by that, that train, if it was trying to stop, it would take another mile to do so. And you didn't even hear it coming. And, and so to try and communicate that to the press and who hopefully gets it out, we go out to the schools, um, you know, people just see the tracks and there's no one on, you know, there's no train around, so they start walking on them. So public awareness is uh, um, what we try to do, and to, 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 to some degree it has some, some success. Um, I don't want to chew up too much time, but let me give you an example of providing a positive alternative. Uh, in Memphis, Union Pacific Railroad Bridge over the Mississippi had an old carriageway that a year ago got converted into a bike ped path with the necessary fencing to keep people off the tracks, but it gives people a way to get across the Mississippi River there. Down in, uh, 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 down in Mississippi, in Vicksburg, there's an old, uh, there's a Kansas City uh, southern bridge, very similar bridge, there's an existing paved road there with a fence across the end of the road saying no pedestrians. The only other alternative to getting across the Mississippi within 70 miles is the interstate highway bridge that has no shoulders. What do people do? If you watch very long, you see people walking on the tracks. That's because the alternative is to swim. And providing that safe alternative, with very similar to what UP did, in Memphis could make a much safer situation in Vicksburg over just putting up no trespassing go away. And, and as you can imagine, I'm sure you can appreciate who pays for that. And so is it the railroad? Is it the community? The community is stretched thin for all the different reasons that I mentioned before. So it's, it's one of those things, um, you know, is it a grant program? I don't know. You know, so they, it, it, it's so complex. The, 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 the issue's clear. The alternatives, everybody can come up with alternatives, but finding the funding to get, that, to get those done are, 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 is a big issue. Yeah, and, and my understanding in Vicksburg is there were some possible sources of funding, but you never got to that point because the KSC, uh, KCS, wouldn't even talk about it. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. Well, Carl. The um, question that I've got has to do with the fact that I, I'm just seeing what was done with the cameras in Orlando. Now, uh, TriRail, the federal government, uh, the FRA, gave us $35 million to make it a sealed corridor where we put four quadrant gates at every one of the 72 stops or 72 crossings. Ten years later, we're still losing 70 gates a month okay, to people driving through the gates. So my first question is, did you see a decrease in people actually breaking gates when you started the program or when they started the program? And the second part is I was never successful in getting the legislature to agree to putting cameras, which was the only thing that ever slowed down the school zones. Is the FRA looking at the possibility of doing federal legislation that would allow for the installation of cameras at crossings um, where that, those crossings uh, are going through these type of problems? Okay, so your first question was down in Orlando. Yes, uh, did it reduce? The, did have it we reduce? seen? Uh, I, I honestly don't know. I don't think that there's. I don't know that it was happening a lot in the first place at this one crossing. So okay. I can't. I can't tell you if. In, in terms of bra breaking of the gate, no. But in terms of violations, we did see something like a 15 percent uh, reduction in violations. Again, this is still early in terms of data collection, but there there was certainly some evidence of improvement in the cameras. And your, so your second, second question is... Yeah, I'd love to see the FRA take on this type of legislation because it's extremely difficult to get through in a number of states. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's something where... I said we were working on this trespass mitigation strategy. You know, the, yeah. we're looking for ideas, things, because we have to give this report to Congress and say, okay, here's what we found, here's what we know is happening. 
if, if we're going to get after this, if we're going to get make an effect, these are the type of things we need to do. So if funding is available, maybe we could do things like that. Um, but legislation-wise, I'm not I'm 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 not aware of anything related to spe specifically to that. And and that's why you know the, the cameras have gotten a lot cheaper. Okay, you yeah. know, I'd say that most of the systems that are having problems can afford the cameras. It's the legislative end of it, trying to get that kind of support. So that's something I'd hope that we could work on with the FRA. Yeah, and and of course talking to your congressman is a is a good idea to get that moving along too. I think that's what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> Hi, Malcolm Kenton with uh, Trains Magazine. I know you, 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 got, you FRA, want to do everything possible to help railroads meet the PTC deadline, but um, can you enlighten us as to what actually will happen if, say, a major commuter rail operator is not going to be able to meet the deadline or um, meet the, qual the uh, qualifications for an extension from FRA? And also what happens if Amtrak refuses to allow a major commuter operator to use its tracks in the Northeast Corridor? That's a good question. And I don't think we're at that point yet. I think we're in the year. We had 41 railroads come in in 45 days. Um, and we emphasize how important it is to get PTC implemented. At this point, we're trying to get them to get up to speed and be able to meet the deadlines. Um, but in answer to your question, that we'll, I guess we'll have to assess where we are towards the end of the year. Um, but right now we're seeing we're seeing a lot of improvement, and we're also talking to the suppliers and trying to get them to help implement PTC before the deadline. Gentlemen, Paul Scutellis, after president, thank you first of all for coming here and, and sharing your your insights. Uh, positive train control. Uh, last week, uh, Juan, I, I was in with your office, our team, meeting with yourself and uh, new administrator Batori. We really appreciated that meeting with the, you and the team. Um, all of us are kind of scratching our heads a little bit wondering what more can we be doing uh, to get our, our members, our railroads across the finish line here, not only to meet this deadline, but at the very least get an extension perhaps if they need that beyond that point uh, after 2018. Um, we've talked about you know, additional meetings and discussions and so forth, and I know you all are doing that, and we as APTA are doing it as well. Is there anything else that you're seeing on the horizon here as you're talking to suppliers, you're talking individually to the agencies that you think we ought to be doing. Uh, we all see the time is growing a little short here, and we want to make sure that we're putting our best efforts forward to, to help people along. Any insights additionally well, you might share? Okay, well, the railroads come in, right, everyone that's required to, to install PTC. Also, the pliers are, are, are coming in, and we're trying to see how quickly they can implement. But another issue is the interoperability and to, trying to get the uh, tenant railroads to work with the host railroads to get up to speed. Um, I think that's a smaller universe of uh, PTC that has to be installed, but it's an important piece. And uh, we'd really like to see the tenants work their plans with the, um, the hosts to get, to get everything interoper interoperable. If, if, I, if I could add to that, yeah. I mean, one of the, like I mentioned while I was talking, I, you know, I don't know all the efforts that every every one of your member railroads has made, um, whether they're doing it independently or they're learning from one another. But you know, the one thing I was talking to Devin Rouse, which I know many of you know who he is, uh, about this, and he stressed to me the value of the lessons learned and and cut, learning from one another, um, because everybody has the same struggles, but you know. Somebody, somebody can learn something from, you know, this is how we overcame that. That's the one thing I would, I would urge uh, your members to do and APTA as an organization to coordinate if, to, the, to the extent you can. Let me, let me uh, highlight uh, some of the coordination that's been going on in, within the commuter rail committee. Um, uh, for those of, who, of, the, of you who are not on the railroad side of the house, there's like five different kinds of positive train control. They're not all just one kind. There's like five different ones. And one of them um, is EATC. And it's typically being in installed by the systems that are somewhat smaller. Um, and so Jim Klein from the Denton County uh, Transit Authority has been coordinated with the other uh, EATC implementers. And they've been doing a great job of 
collaborating, lessons learned, sharing information, um, having forums, and, and really demonstrating um, a collegial cooperative spirit to, to implement this. And they've been making great progress on sharing information. Uh, IETMS has got a, is another, at the, at the more, it's all complicated, but a, a different version of it and uh, a positive train control. And they, they likewise have a user group and um, uh, obviously uh, uh, South, uh, Southern California, the, the, uh, uh, um, the trans, TransLink, TransLink, yeah. They went out and, and uh, toured their system and, and uh, they're, they're likewise doing that same type of um, uh, data sharing and, and uh, lessons learned. So. Uh, there's a lot of that going on. Um, it's complicated systems, and, but there are, is progress from a coordination standpoint on those various systems. So just wanted to highlight that for the group. Thank you. Please. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Peter Pizer with Pizer Associates. Thanks to all of you for being here. I uh, had a question about the Transit-Oriented Development Authority under the RIF program. Uh, of course, the Bureau is very involved in that also, but I know that you all have been dealing with how to implement that effectively and in, 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 uh, in compliance with the FAST Act. Um, so I wanted to ask where things are in that process of additional guidance coming out on the TOD authority within RIF, and also how you're viewing the upcoming uh, sunset of that at the end of fiscal 19, um, which is only now about 18 months away, and do you think the administration would be amenable to an extension of that, uh, potentially at least till the end of the FAST Act uh, in 2020. You want to start it or you want to? No, why don't you go ahead. So uh, as you know and you stated, the Bureau is sort of managing that process. So we're, our, our role now in the RIF and TIFIA programs is to support the Bureau in you know, environmental review, engineering reviews, and so forth. Um, I'm not familiar with where they are in terms of issuing guidance, but we are certainly on a case-by-case -case basis reviewing any application that comes in under the TOD provisions. And to my knowledge, we haven't received any at this point, but uh, when we do, and if we do, then we would be evaluating, you know, anything that relates to an extension of a statutory deadline is something that we don't typically weigh in on, uh, and if Congress were to extend it, I'm sure we would implement that. Uh, but I'm, I don't believe we have any uh, public stance other than that. No, I think that's, that's correct. Quick question again from the APTA staff, and again, we do appreciate you being here. Uh, so one of my questions, or uh, my question is, we have been talking to Congress, there's been some uh, debate about the CRISI program eligibility could that be used, uh, and, and I think right now it's limited to intercity and, and freights for safety purposes. So if, if Congress were to, so we've, we've actually talked to them, you know, requested, would they be willing to open that eligibility up to, uh, to commuter railroads for PTC fund uh, grants and so forth? If, if Congress were to do that, uh, how, would it be, uh, how, how hard or easy would it be for you to look at the existing grant applications under that program and, and consider uh, PTC as an eligible uh, uh, activity for commuters? So just, just to clarify, under the current <coughs> framework, uh, commuters may be eligible, but there has to be an inner city passenger rail per benefit as well, or a freight benefit. Uh, and so on a shared corridor, there could be, you know, mutual benefit there. Uh, in terms of what Congress is looking at right now, it, it would be presumably in the FY18 omnibus if they were to do something. Uh, and unless that language were retroactive, it would be sort of for going forward applications under that program. Uh, and Congress can say, hey, commuters are eligible, commuter purpose is eligible, and that's what we'll administer. Uh, we've done that already. We've worked with FTA on the uh, on their program uh, that was also a fast act program with a $199 million pot of money for PTC, where we worked closely with FTA on selection of grants, uh, and then uh, they're administering those grants. But uh, there were a number of commuter railroads as well as inner city railroads that were uh, that were selected under that program. So there's precedent. And, and I think the, the, the practical matter is. Um, 
the timing is such that if uh, if this equipment hasn't been acquired yet, um, it's going to be uh, impossible to, to really do that. Um, we, we're always looking for ways to find money. Um, just for those who aren't in the in the commuter rail or, uh, or, or inner city with PTC business, um, I, I mentioned the, the, the need for the extension, which is very needed, but the amount of work and the amount of money and the, and the effort that was, has been put in uh, to acquire Spectrum, uh, which is not easy to get, to, to, to get, and to find out who owns the Spectrum and to pay for it was the beginning of it. Um, and then uh, uh, deciding what type of system you're going to use and start the procurement process to buy this equipment. Um, the suppliers are all geared up and, and producing the, the, the components and, and, the, and the software designs and the back office. A very complicated system, a lot of different procurements. The industry spent uh, $3.8 billion um, to implement that. And, um, and it's just this, this mountain of, of, of work that's going on, and then the installation and the testing uh, with this deadline. And fortunately, um, baked into the process is the potential for extensions if you meet certain criteria and, and share that. And, and so uh, what's been very beneficial is uh, FRA's um, willingness and availability to, to work to understand the process and to help communicate the needs and, and again, the industry working together to help you know, each other and kind of share the information. So everyone is, is dedicated to it, but just like um, on the basketball team, uh, some people got to play a lot and I had to sit the bench quite a bit, but uh, uh, some people are better at it than others. But no, it's, uh, it's, but people are all trying. We were all trying. Um, and they all are trying. It's, it's just, uh, um, it's going to be important to, to make sure we're all getting there at the same, you know, making the deadlines and, and meeting the requirements. Um, a, a question in the regulatory reform area. The administration's made a, you know, announcements that for every one regulation, you know, two will be cut, and it seems like they're perhaps even reducing uh, the regulatory requirements even further than that. So I just want to ask how FRA uh, might be treating that, and um, that's my question. Yeah, so we have a regulatory reform task force, which is uh, headed by the Deputy Secretary, Jeff Rosen, and we're reviewing um, regulations that are antiquated or no longer appli ap applicable. Um, and so that's the way we're approaching it. Um, safety is the number one concern always um, at FRA and, and Department of Transportation. But we have been able to successfully identify regulations that are no longer pertinent. Um, and, and as um, technology advances, that's going to continue to be the case. I, I can say we're also looking at waivers. There's a lot of waivers, long-standing waivers, that maybe be, should be incorporated into the regulations that will help reduce the regulatory burden mm -hmm. on, uh, on industry. So we're, we're, we're coming at this from a couple of different angles. Well, thank you very much, uh, Juan and, and uh, Carl and Paul, for joining us and sharing all this uh, very good information, very timely information. We appreciate your being here and appreciate your dedication to railroad safety and, and the work of the FRA and, and cooperation with us in the commuter rail and inner city uh, arena. So join me in thanking our, our guests. And thank you for your attendance and we will be around if you have any further questions. Thank you very much.